You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. Uh, my guest today is popular novelist Allison Pace, and she'll be talking to us today about her recently released nonfiction debut, You Tell Your Dog First. So we're interested to talk to Allison about the book as well as a, a little bit about the uh, collection of stories and how it's a little different than maybe some of the stuff that she's done in the past, but still have wonderful uh, furry friends involved. So it's going to be a great interview, and everybody uh, will look forward to that. So everybody hang tight. We're going to come right back after these messages. We'll talk to Allison Pace. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. <laughs> We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Is the coast clear? Yes. Let's go. Are you sure they went to Petco? Where else would they go? Oopsie. Hey, calm down. I smell presents. <gasps> go to PetcoDeals.com and get $6 off your order of $60 or more and up to 40% off hundreds of holiday items at Petco. That's PetcoDeals.com. Go now. Uh-oh, step on it. Okay. Oh, not on my tail. <laughs> Petco, where the pets go. X-Power is a global brand that offers a complete line of stand dryers, cage dryers, and multiple blasters that cater to both home and professional groomers. Designed to be quiet, lightweight, and powerful, X-Power pet dryers will save you time, energy, and money. The X-Power B2 Pro at Home Dryer is the perfect holiday gift for family and friends. Please check out our holiday specials at viperpet.com and amazon.com. For more information, visit xpower.ws or call 855-855-8868. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and joining me now is award-winning author, Allison Pace. And we're here to talk to Allison a little bit about her recently released book, You Tell Your Dog First. So, Allison, welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for coming back, and we're always excited when you've got uh, some new stuff for us to read. Uh, so, tell us a little bit more about uh, the latest, uh, You Tell Your Dog First. Okay, you tell your dog first. So it is, as I heard you say before, it's my nonfiction debut. So it is, it's my memoir. It's the story of my life with dogs. So I grew up with about four dogs at any given time. And as you know, I'm now a big dog person. So it's sort of a bunch of different stories on what that was like and how it shaped the person I am and my feelings about dogs and people and the way that dogs just make our lives so much better. Absolutely. In a nutshell. In a nutshell, exactly. And they'll, have, they'll have to get the book so they can read more about it and uh, definitely encourage everybody to do it. It's a great piece. I think it's fantastic how you put uh, everything together. The stories came together even though they're separate stories and uh, – uh, we know your passion for uh, for animals and passion for dogs. But how did this come about? How is this, obviously, as we said, a departure from some of the stuff you've done in the past? How did you decide one day that, hey, this is what I, I need to do with this? I think the way it is with a lot of books is it's never really that one day. Um, it's always sort of these small kernels that keep just gathering momentum. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it was just looking at the past five books I've written, which I've I've always written novels you know, I don't, I don't write novels about women hiking up Everest. I, I've written these novels about women living in New York City with dogs. And so it was, you know, obviously this was all stuff that was very close to home. And as someone who's written so much fiction about women and dogs, I said, you know, I, I should really write a little bit about my own life as a, as a woman with a dog. And I had written one essay, which was in an anthology called Howl, which was a collection of the best contemporary dog wit, I think it was called. And I'd written an essay um, called Can We Interest You in a Piece of Cheese, which was about growing up with these at least four dogs at any given time. And we would always you know, suggest that guests give our dogs American cheese when they came in the house so as not to be, you know, knocked down to the ground. Right. So I was so it was this essay about this whole scene, which is actually included in the book. So I was thinking about that essay and then just, you know, started writing more essays about my childhood with dogs and then in my adult life with dogs and 
that and sort of, you know, started putting them together chronologically and realized like it was, it's a little bit like how I imagine musicians make an album. So it was in taking all these little pieces together and making a story, which was very different writing experience from a novel. Yeah. And, and I want to delve into that. I'm going to hold that off just a little bit because I, I do want it from a writing aspect, talk to a little bit more about that. But I have to talk to you about dogs in general. Growing up in a rural environment with a lot of different dogs and then coming to a big city and the relationship you have with a particular dog or dogs in your life in a big city, what do you find are the differences? What are some of the nuances that you find that uh, are little caveats to uh, comparing one to the other? Well, you know, there's a lot of differences for me just because growing up, you know, they were my family dogs. So that there's a different feeling than when it's actually like just your responsibility. And also growing up, you know, the wonderful, wonderful dogs that I was lucky enough to share my childhood with. But um, there were also so many of them that I feel that I have a, a much different relationship with Carly, who is my one dog and um, who's only my dog. She's not an entire family's dog. And um, also, I think that living in the city you are a lot closer with your dog because you're really responsible for everything. It's not a matter of, you know, opening up the barn door and letting them out or opening up the kitchen door and letting them outside to where they really live their own lives. Sort of their whole lives are really dependent on you. You know, every walk Carly goes on, every, everything that she does, we're together. So it's, it is a bit of a closer bond, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And then I do think living in the city, I think the most important thing if you're going to have a dog in the city is, you know, if there's any way to be near a park. So I write a lot about this in the book that I wanted to make sure I stayed uptown to be near Central Park. And um, so Carly and I go every morning for an hour, which is my favorite part of every day. And I feel really lucky for that, to be a country dog for an hour every day. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Except for she's on a leash, of course, I would assume. No, actually, if you are in Central Park before nine o'clock in the morning, dogs can be off leash so it's really just one of these amazing amazing things about new york city is you go to central park um before nine o'clock and the entire park is filled with just dogs running loose i did not know that that is very it's fantastic yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think it was probably like 10 10 or 15 years ago i walked into central park early one morning and there were just dogs everywhere and i was like what is going on <laughs> <laughs> Um, is it, is so it's a, a ma- really great site. Oh my god! Is this just a masterful plan by the city to uh, weed out the people that have stayed a little bit too long overnight in the, <laughs> in the park? Right. Yeah, all the squirrels and all the people that stayed too long disappear at seven a.m. when all the dogs show up. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So you got to tell us a little bit more about the uh, the furry star of the book, Carly, and uh, give us a, a little bit of insight on uh, what type of breed Carly is, and maybe even one of the things uh, put you on the spot. Maybe one of the biggest things that uh, Carly has taught you. Ah, okay. Um, well, Carly, we'll do the easy one first. So Carly is a Westie. She's a West Highland White Terrier, and she is now seven years old. She's about seven and a half. I got her when she was a year and a half old. She'd been with a breeder who was showing her, and her show career wasn't working out. So she, um, they didn't want to keep her, and she needed a home. So that was how I found her. And um, the thing she's taught me, I mean, I think that this sounds cliche because I think a lot of people say this about their dogs, but I guess cliches become cliches because for a reason. Um, <laughs> but she's she's so good at living in the moment. You know, she doesn't, you know, she, if she's cooped up in the apartment all day, you know, once she's outside, she's just outside and enjoying herself. She's not thinking about, the you know, anything unpleasant that happened. And she's just, she's really just enjoys herself. So I think I've learned of just being around someone, someone, something, um, a being that is so in the moment and just really makes the most out of every moment. She's taught me a lot from that. Yeah, and that's probably the most valuable lesson that we mm-hmm. have to learn as humans uh, because, you know, we view our animals as, as part of our life, part of our family. We get enjoyment out of them. Sometimes they drive us crazy, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. But we as humans, we have a, wouldn't you agree, have a very difficult time just trying to live in the moment, live for now and stop worrying about what happened to us in the past and what's going to happen to us in the future. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because I do notice that with her. Like I'll just, I'll see her running around in a field and having the best time. And it sort of is this little yellow flag that pops up that is saying like, look, she's not worried about what it's going to be like this afternoon or and she's not, you know, holding a grudge that, you know, she didn't have a great morning or something. So it's, it's, it's a nice reminder. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's how we need to, to live our lives. And the, and also not worrying about our pets. Uh, you know, I, I work a lot with uh, rescue organizations and uh, they do fantastic work. But a lot of times people that, that work there or adopt the animals, they're, they're so concerned about uh, the animal's past that even when they introduce the animal, mm-hmm. it's not, hi, this is a, you know, uh, this is the dog named Spot. It's more of, mm-hmm. you know, this is the dog that had the hurt foot because someone abused it and his name is Spot. And, uh, and yeah. I know I, I often have to tell them that, okay, well, it's great to know those histories, but let's release that history and let's focus on what Spot's uh, purpose is now and what Spot can accomplish and teach us. Yeah, that, that's a good lesson too. Now, we know in recent uh, books that we focused a lot on our heroic character, the pug, you know, uh-huh. about a, a pug's tail and, uh, and a pug hill, et cetera. The question is, how did this come about? How did uh, Carly come into your life in that aspect? And ha- how did you choose uh, pugs in the past as being the uh, heroic character? And now your own uh, heroic character in your life is, is a different breed. I know that's always a little bit of a hurdle for people <laughs> to get over um, that I actually don't have a pug because my novel Pug Hill, I think, is the, um, the novel that everyone associates with me. So Pug Hill actually came about because there is a place in Central Park where it does, they don't do it anymore, but years ago, all these pugs would come and meet there every Saturday afternoon, and so the character in Pug Hill doesn't have a dog, as for for a long time I was in New York without a dog, and she just goes to watch the pugs at Pug Hill, and that's sort of her, her happy place. So when I had, and I write a lot about this in the in the book, and went, for a while I was writing and I lived in a building that didn't allow dogs, so it was sort of this big um, exodus to find a rental building that allowed dogs in a neighborhood near the park. And once once I did that, I was sort of open. I was, you know, any sort of dog that it was going to work out with, it was. So I was just signing up with rescue groups and contacting people and looking around. And um, I, um, I found the Westie before I found the pug, so I have a Westie. <laughs> and I always like those stories. You know, people are, uh, when they're considering having a dog or, or even a cat in their mm-hmm. life, they sort of think, well, I want this one because it, you know, it doesn't shed or it has this personality, et cetera. <laughs> but you, don't you agree? It usually turns out that they find us that just happens yeah. and they show up and our heart opens up and that that's it. It's over. Yeah, it is. And um, yeah, and like now, I mean, I I love pugs, obviously. Um, You know, I'm very fond of pugs, but I can't, you know, just all the the, the amount of time Carly and I spend, you know, walking around and jogging and all of that, I can't really imagine having a pug because it it would be so different from the sort of experience I have with Carly, which, you know, feels like the perfect dog experience to me. Yeah, but I, I but I think if I was right sitting here talking to you about my pug, I'd be like, I can't imagine anything but the pug. I think <laughs> you know that's the thing is just any any dog, you know, that that you're supposed to be with your dog, so that's that they're right. all great. Yeah, and, you know, and I think going yeah. back on one of the original questions I asked you about it, you know, having a dog in the big city, it's uh, I'm sure it has its challenges. It's very structured. I'm assuming uh, making sure the dog uh, you clean up after the dog, and there's only certain places mm-hmm. you can take him, etc. But I would think that in a big city, it's probably pretty important from uh, just a, a social aspect and to getting to know who your neighbors really are. Uh, dog tends to uh, bring that together. Oh, absolutely. That was a big part of the reason I wanted to write the book was just thinking of how many people I know because of my dog and how um, I live in this this wonderful building in New York City where I know all of my neighbors. Like we all know each other's names and we all know each other's dog's names and all of that. And I've lived in so many places in this city and never known any of my neighbors. And that's the first chapter of the book is how here we all know each other and everyone's friends. Um, and it's it's because we all have dogs. Yeah, it's a great, great common denominator. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I find that to be true. Actually, I guess I definitely visualize that in a big city. I don't live in, in uh, the Atlanta mm-hmm. metropolitan area, but I live in the northern suburbs. And, and even here, it's that way. Everybody owns their, their large houses and has their 2.5 kids, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But it's not until, you know, either the kids get introduced or more likely the dogs get introduced, then you find out your neighbor's names and, uh, and mm-hmm. what they do and all the, that wonderful stuff. Yeah, well, it's, it's, there are these, Wonderful welcomers, because it's, you'd never just sort of, or in New York, I don't think people would just say hi to someone in an elevator and be like, hi, who are you? What do you do? But if you have a dog with you, someone's like, hey, what's your dog's name? When did you get her? How old is she? And then you start talking. Or if you brought up the conversation in the elevator, they'd probably make sure they didn't get in the elevator a second time with you. (laughs) 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 Right. 
Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, uh, but we'll come back and continue our conversations with Allison Pace. Uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, book, You Tell Your Dog First, and all the other wonderful things she has going on. So everybody hang tight. We're going to come right back. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. It's the holidays at PetSmart, so come one and all. There are hundreds of gifts for pets big and pets small. Toys only at PetSmart so special and new. They'll love the gifts. You'll love the value. Hurry to PetSmart today for your very best friend and save 30 to 50% before the holiday ends. The holidays are just around the corner. Go to PetLifeRadio.com slash PetSmart and save up to 30% on awesome gifts for the pets and pet people in your life. Toys, collars, leashes, PetSmart gift cards, treats, and more. So shop early and save money. Go to PetLifeRadio.com slash PetSmart today. Dyson. The new Dyson Animal Backs are powerful bagless upright backings for homes with pets. Air muscle and radio root cyclone technology generates the strongest suction power to powerfully remove dust, dirt, and pet hair from the home or car. To order your Dyson Animal Back, go to DysonDeals.com. DysonDeals.com to order your Dyson Animal Back today. Dyson. Music to your ears. Coast to coast and around the world, it's All Behave with Arden Moore. Find out why cats and dogs do the things they do and get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get great tail-wagging pet tips and have a fur-flying fun time. All Behave with America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Uh, this is your host, Tim Link. And we're talking to award-winning author Allison Pace about her recently released book, You Tell Your Dog First. Now, Allison, um, tell us a, a little bit about, uh, you know, you write a lot of different uh, stories and essays, and you compiled them in this wonderful book. But sorting through all those and determining what order they go in and which of the stories that are, are suitable for the book and trying to narrow them down, how was that process for you? How did that go ab- about? Was it easy, did you find, or was it much tougher than you ever realized? Oh, the second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, much tougher than I ever realized. Because I can, I mean, I'm not the speediest writer in the world, but I can usually think of a novel and, you know, get be done with the first draft of a novel inside of a year. And um, with this, I was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to write essays and, you know, this, 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 and I'll, I'll be done in a year. And um, it, uh, it wound up taking me four years to do this book. Um, <laughs> so it was just really a matter, I think, of not so much of finding my voice, because I feel like I'd, I'd found that a while ago, but just wrapping my head around writing about myself and then figuring out, you know, what really worked in a memoir collection about dogs, like what fit, what didn't, what was really just a story about something else entirely that, um, you know, I was wedging a dog into and um, just really sort of whittling it down and whittling it down until I finally got to this group of essays that, you know, form sort of like a memoir in essays um, that really got at the one, that one thing, sort of you tell your dog first, which is the closeness that you have with dogs and the way that dogs connect you to the world. So it took a lot of time and there was a lot of many, many essays that did not make the cut. Yeah, I find that interesting. You know, I, I write obviously a lot of uh, a nonfiction myself and publish, but in uh, you know essays or story form, et cetera. But going back and trying to compile those into to a book or compile those into a collection, uh, I do find it more challenging at times. You know, I, I of course I, I don't have the reference that you do writing uh, writing a mm-hmm. novel, but it is challenging because stories you think are great once you get them out, you're like, oh, well, that's not that good or that relevant, or I don't have as much material on that as I thought I did. And other ones just seem to flow, um, uh, and you have a lot more into it than, than you'd ever imagined. 
Yeah, yeah. I think with shorter pieces where you're trying to, because the thing about this book is it does, you know, start and, you know, and go about, across a bunch of years, but they're also each, each essay is its own individual piece. So you could really just dip in and read one thing and then you, it doesn't need to connect to the others. So it was that thing of having things connect and then, um, but also standing alone and having a, you know, complete piece of writing that's 15 pages long as opposed to, 350, you know, I'm, I'm used to having 350 pages to say something and make my point rather than 15 pages. So it was very different for me. So in putting this book together, you said it took four years, correct? To, to put four, this together? Year, four years, but also one year where I just said, this is not coming out the way I want it to. So I'm going to put it aside and do something else for a year. So which that made all the difference. Once I put it aside for a year and came back to it, then that Last year was a piece of cake because I really I had a year to um, percolate on it and sort of figure out what was going wrong. Wow, that's amazing. That's I want to delve into that just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. The fact that you, you wrote this. It, it, let me retract a little bit. My personality is mm-hmm. once I start something, I gotta finish it, or it'll just drive me crazy unless I get it off my plate. But, <laughs> Did you write and set aside for a year because you had other wonderful projects you were working on and other things took your demand? Or was it a matter of you need to set it aside and let it percolate a little bit more and then come back to it? You know, I'd never done that before. I had always, I teach writing and I always say sometimes the best thing you can do is just walk away from it and leave it and leave it for a couple of weeks and all of that. I'd never really taken that advice and I'd always started something and finished it sort of in the way that you said that it would just make me too crazy um, not to finish it. Um, I think at some point with this, I crossed the line and it was like, okay, this is going to make me too crazy if I do finish it. Um, so it was just, it was just a point with this book where I was like, I just need to put it aside and really get some space from it and some distance. And that's when I I wrote a pug's tale in that time period because I said I just want to go back and write a novel. So I wrote a pug's tale and then I came back to this. And um, it was just much easier to look at it after I hadn't looked at it for a year. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, because that's uh, that. That's always been the hardest thing for for me to do. Is actually, you know, I always find getting started is always a challenge. I have an idea, but I getting actually sitting down and putting those first words down is a challenge. And then just once I get rolling, it's hard to stop and set it aside. And you know, I've talked to many other authors, and, and uh, many of my have done that. They've set aside projects for years and years after they've started mm-hmm. and came back and. I don't know how they do that. It, it just drives me crazy. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd ever do it again. I mean, I, I think I think maybe it was because it wasn't a novel that it, it worked. You know, sometimes I feel like with a novel, you just you have to really push through and then see what you have. But with this, I think with all its different pieces. For some reason, that was just what needed to be done. Yeah. So, you know, I had plenty of time where I was like, I'm not going back, but then I really wanted to go back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, th- the cool thing about this is the ongoing essay, actually, because uh, once this is done, you have more stories and obviously a, a longer life to live with uh, Carly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your thoughts on uh, the differences between uh, writing fiction and nonfiction? Uh, are there some preferences you have, or, or are you looking to uh, – uh, continue on this trend, or what's your thoughts? Oh, I know it's funny. I mean, based on what we, what we were just talking about, if two years ago you'd said, "Are you, are you going to write another essay collection after this, or a memoir?" It's, no, absolutely not. Um, but now that it's done and it's out, and I read them again, and I'm so happy with the way it turned out that I, I really think that this book is my favorite out of all of them. So I think um, absolutely, I do. I do really want to keep writing nonfiction and keep writing about my life with dogs and dogs in general. So I think there will be another memoir after this. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> Why Hopefully, you, it won't take four years. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, I want you to do both, so that because that'll be great and give me more. Yeah. So I'm. I'm still. I'm still doing doing novels. So I will do both. So now I'll be. Uh, split personality writer. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Now, after everybody reads uh, You Tell Your Dog First, what would you say you'd want, if you had to pick one thing you want the readers to walk away with, what would you want that to be? Just that this all-consuming, wonderful love that we have for our dogs is is not unique to one person, that it's something that, that we all share. So I'd love, you know, I've gotten some, you know, the book just came out, so I've gotten a couple of notes from people that are like, oh my God, I love my dog so much, and I do this and I do that, and I'm so glad I'm not the only one. Like, if, if that's what people are getting, and if they're just really identifying with this sort of, you know, it's a love letter to my dog, and it's a love letter to dogs, and if people are identifying with that and um, being made happy by that and getting something out of that, I'm thrilled. And going back 
back to that common denominator again. You know, people uh, often think, "Wow, you know, my crazy dog does this." Uh, and then when they find out somebody else's crazy dog does the same thing, they don't feel uh, alone anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Well, that, that's I think so much of so much of writing, whether it's novels or memoirs or nonfiction or essays, is just um, just a way of connecting and a way of you know just sort of recognizing what happens to you happens to other people. Yeah. Um, now, does uh, Carly get to go with you on the uh, the book signings and the talks and uh, everything? You know, she has not because I've been. Most of the places I'm going are on Amtrak, and Amtrak does not allow dogs. Ah. So I know, unless she's a service dog, which she is not. <laughs> but, um, so Amtrak hasn't allowed her to come on the on the book tour. So she's home with her her dog sitter Fabio. <laughs> he's written about in the in the book. <laughs> That's probably better anyway. You're you're out there earning the money for more treats and more toys and bring them home. More treats that, and toys. Yeah, the public appearance is not really Carly's bag. She she doesn't really love it. She <laughs> um, unless it's a public appearance in Central Park, she's not such a fan. So. Not such a fan. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. that's fascinating about dogs as well because I had um, my two boys, the boys Buzz and Woody Schnauzers, who have made oh, their the Schnauzers. Great boys, same brothers. You know, brothers from the same litter, but they're they're night and day. Woody was definitely not the guy you'd want to take out to public and uh, be part of the book <laughs> tour. He wouldn't be handle it very well. And his brother was uh, Mr. Congeniality. He would go anywhere, any place, any time, and put a smile on his face. And uh, uh, <laughs> so it goes back to the fact that you know every animal has their own personality and their preferences. Yeah, and, they uh, really do. And and yeah, Carly can be cautious, and if it's a bookstore filled with people, she's a little nervous. <laughs> That's right. So stay home, Carly, with Fabio. It'll work out great. More treats. More treats when mommy's gone, especially. That's always good. But yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Allison, where can people find out more about you and Carly and all the wonderful stuff going on and, and uh, for them to get a copy of the book, You Tell Your Dog First? The first place to go, I guess, is my website, which is allisonpace.com, and that's Allison with one L. I'm on Facebook at Allison Pace Books. I'm on Twitter at Allison Pace. And I have a Pinterest page or a Pinterest page where I post pictures of all my dogs. And that's uh, Pinterest.com slash The Alley Show. The Alley Show. So everybody check yeah, it out. So. Sign up for all that. Go on to Facebook. Go on to Allison's uh, website, AllisonPace.com. Uh, find out. Definitely pick up a copy of the book. It's available everywhere you go and online as well. Allison, it's, it's always great to talk to you. Congratulations on the success of the book. Uh, I think it's a wonderful collection and, and big kudos uh, for putting it all together. Thanks so much. It's always nice to come on this show. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. <laughs> We're coming to the end of the show today. Uh, I want to thank Allison Pace once again for coming on uh, board and talking to us today. Everybody pick up a copy of You Tell Your Dog First. Great, great essays. Great read uh, by Allison Pace. Once again, coming to the end of the show, thanks everybody for uh, listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I want to thank uh, our sponsors and producers for making the show possible. Uh, to find out more about me, Tim Link, and the other guests I've interviewed on the Animal Rights Show, uh, and read my blogs and find out about all the wonderful shows that are offered on Pet Life Radio, you can go to PetLifeRadio.com. It's PetLifeRadio.com. Download this episode and all the other wonderful episodes that we have. And while you're there, check out uh, all the wonderful shows and, and the other hosts that we have on Pet Life Radio. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the show, please email me. You can email me at Tim at PetLifeRadio.com. It's Tim at PetLifeRadio.com, and I will be glad to answer your questions, uh, entertain your comments, and bring on the people you want to hear the most onto the show. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life. Share it in a blog, article, or in a book. And who knows? You may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.